Today we're taking a look at the origin and the history of Ant-Man. If you didn't know that at one time Ant-Man was also called the Wasp, this video might be for you. And I do have a trivia question for you, so go ahead down to the comment section when you're done with this and give me the answer you think is best. Who, as it relates to Ant-Man, is Chuck Barris? Hi, I'm Jesse and you're watching JLS Comics. Thanks for pressing play. Today we're taking a look at the origin and the history of a character that's been around longer than the Avengers themselves. A character whose cinematic appearances bring humor and levity to the world, while his comic book counterpart is often fraught with depression and divorce and inadequacy. Who? Ant-Man. But it's not as simple as that because Ant-Man himself has gone by many a name, as well as multiple people donning the mantle of the Ant-Man through the years. We'll touch on all of these, but our primary focus today will be on the biophysicist named Dr. Henry Hank Pym. We'll go through his history and at the end I'll tell you which comic book issues contain key first appearances just in case any of this piques your interest and you're inclined to read more about it. Before Spider-Man, before Thor, before the Avengers, there was Ant-Man. The year was 1962 and Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Larry Lieber were coming up with a sci-fi and fantasy stories for their Tales to Astonish title. A title often containing multiple stories and whose purpose or one of them was to circumvent the independent news distributors cap on how many comic books Marvel Comics could publish monthly. For more on that, check out my How DC Saved Marvel Comics video. Just a couple months after the dawn of the first family of comics, the Fantastic Four, came Tales to Astonish number 27. And in this issue, we find scientist Hank Pym who discovered Pym particles and who created two serums. Let's pause here and talk about what Pym particles and the microverse are and why it's called the quantum realm in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Pym particles are rare subatomic particles that allow the user to alter size and mass and the distance between particles while retaining the size and strength of their normal size. And by doing this, he's circumventing square cube law with this capability. And it relates to quantum field theory, possibly quantum chromodynamics, and even the multi dimensional aspects of super string theory. Shrinking down to the subatomic level allows the user to enter an alternate reality called the microverse. It's a place where space and time are irrelevant and the problem here is that Marvel Comics used the microverse in a book called The Micronauts which was created to sell toys for a company called Mego. The rights were licensed by Mego to Marvel under then uh, editor-in-chief Jim Shooter. After Mego went bankrupt the IP was purchased by Hasbro who is currently in a deal with Paramount for the movie as well as IDW for publishing. So for Marvel Studios to use this, the concept is the same, but the microverse name itself was changed to the quantum realm. Now back to our story. After successful shrinking a chair, Pym needed a human subject and ultimately decided to use himself as the test subject. Well, he shrunk down and found himself in a battle with an army of ants. And the story is called The Man in the Ant Hill. A friendly ant helped him return to his lab where he regrew to his normal size, much to his relief. But it was this encounter counter that made him infatuated with ants and eight issues later Pym was back, but this time with an Ant-Man suit and a cybernetic helmet that he had developed in his lab. His theory was that he could communicate with the ants through transmitting and receiving psionic and electrical waves. And in Tales to Astonish number 44, just a few issues later, we meet Pym's lab partner, Janet Van Dyne, to whom he had revealed the suit and his intentions. But because her father, Vernon, was killed by an alien, she immediately wanted in on the project and her intent actually was to seek revenge for the death of her father. And just about a year later, it was Hank Pym as Ant-Man and Janet as the Wasp who became founding members of the Avengers. Um, it was after a team had assembled by Thor, actually. Uh, they defeated Loki, and it was Ant-Man himself who suggested that they form the team, and it was the Wasp who came up with the name the Avengers. Pym continued throughout the years and issues to be a part of the Avengers, whether he was Ant-Man or he went by Giant-Man. Pym was typically at his lab working on his experiments and trying to come up with his next big breakthrough. And in Avengers number 55, he did. We we learned that Ultron was a villain and he's really become one of the most fearsome villains not only for the Avengers but for the Marvel Universe as a whole. Ultron's an advanced AI robot that he had created with actually pretty serious Oedipus complex. In fact it was Ultron who a couple issues later Avengers 57 created the synthesoid superhero Vision. His intent was to use this new robot against Hank and Jan. But later on, you know, frustrated that he couldn't make another discovery as great as the Pym particles, he was racked with guilt about creating Ultron, weighed down by depression and failure, feelings of scientific inadequacy. Pym spiraled downward mentally. 
He took on this persona called the Yellow Jacket. He'd go out and fight. He was putting innocents in harm way and overall really reckless and ended up being court-martialed by the Avengers. But in retaliation for that, he wanted to create another robot to attack the Avengers in their mansion. Janet found out and protested and he smacked her. And that one instance became one of the dirtiest, most uncomfortable few panels and events in the history of Marvel. After that, Pym was kicked out of the Avengers and Janet and Hank divorced. But Jim Shooter later recounted that issue on his website when he said he put his hands up in despair and frustration making a sort of get away from me gesture while not looking at her. Bob Hall who had been taught by John Bushima to always go for the most extreme action turned that into a right cross. There was no time to have it redrawn which to this day has caused the tragic story of Hank Pym to be known as the wife beater story. Pym came back eventually to the Avengers, helping out with the West Coast Avengers, kind of like as their version of Jarvis. Pym was off and on again with the Avengers for years. Sometimes he was Ant-Man, sometimes he was Giant Man, sometimes he was Goliath. But years later, Wasp was killed during Avengers Disassembled. And Hank himself was replaced by a Skrull during an event called Secret Invasion. After Secret Invasion, he came back to Earth. He took up the mantle of the Wasp to honor his dead wife. And when he did that, he helped to build up the uh, the team called the Mighty Avengers. At one point, the cosmic entity Eternity revealed to Pym that he was Earth's scientific supreme, a uh, scientific counterpart to Earth's sorcerer supreme, which is, of course, Doctor Strange. Loki later said that he was posing as Eternity to try to manipulate Pym, but during the AVX event, he helped Iron Man make the Phoenix Killer armor, and he also helped Pixie kind of clean up things after Scott Summer was running rampant as the Dark Phoenix. So he kind of did come up eventually with some other notable achievements. During Age of Ultron, a Wolverine from the future came back in time to the time when Hank was working on the Ultron project with the intent to kill him but then another wolverine came from another timeline saying that in his timeline hank did die but morgan Le Fay became this massive threat to the world a constant threat so ultimately hank was allowed to live but he was tasked with creating a hidden failsafe program inside of ultron that they could activate and destroy ultron if they ever needed to there was another event, it was in an original graphic novel called Rage of Ultron, and in this, Hank and Ultron became one. So, there was a time in the 616 history when Ultron had attempted to access the U.S. nuclear arsenal. He was encountered by the Avengers, one of which was Ant-Man. Uh, he was tricked into entering this Quinjet that was immediately launched into space, ridding the world of Ultron. But that Quinjet crashed on Titan, where the Ultron robot proceeded to take over the Eternals AI system. It's called Isaac, it's an acronym, as well as the Eternals themselves. So when they came back to Earth, there was a confrontation, again, uh, with Vision and Ant-Man. There was one case where Vision phased through Ultron. And when he did that, Ultron feigned some pain, and the reaction from Hank was to grab his arm. Right when he did that, Vision phased out of Ultron. And when that happened, the two merged together. So between Ultron's rage, Hank's belief that he was basically abandoned by the Avengers, which he wasn't, they thought he died, um, this new Cyber Hank, if you will, became a pretty formidable threat to the Avengers. But eventually this Cyber Hank was sent into the sun to kill him. But right before he could die, he shrunk down to the subatomic level and he hid inside of an elementary particle called a neutrino. Just kind of hung out there and was waiting for the solar winds to carry him back to Earth. Which happened. Ultron came back, found out that the Affinity Gems were back around, and he ended up being able to steal the Soul Gem from Magus. And when he did that, a piece of Hank's soul became trapped inside the Soul Gem, and that piece of his soul encountered a piece of Gamora's soul that was also trapped in there. So about his family, Hank and Janet had a daughter named Hope, and that was in the MC2 universe, and, and there Hope had a brother named Henry Pym Jr., who also went by his own superhero name, Big Man. In 2016, we learned that prior to Tales to Astonish 27, Hank had a wife, was a Hungarian political dissident. Uh, her name was Maria. She was actually killed by government operatives, and their daughter Nadia was captured and trained in the Soviet's Red Room. It's the same training program that gave us uh, Black Widow, you know, Natasha Romanoff. Nadia goes by the name Unstoppable Wasp. And as an interesting aside, the name Nadia actually means hope in many of the Slavic languages. So that's maybe like a subtle. Easter egg by uh, Master Scribe Mark Weed. So there's been a couple other people who have gone by the name Ant-Man. You know, we had Scott Lang. He was a thief. He became Ant-Man. He had to steal the suit. Uh, his intent was to save his daughter who had some serious heart problems. Uh, at one point, his daughter, Cassie, took up the gnome de guerre of stature in Young Avengers after uh, her father died. And then later on, uh, went by the name of Stinger. Another guy was named Eric O'Grady. He was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who found uh, an Ant-Man suit in a S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters. He stole the armor, and he actually was using it to pick up women. I'm going to add Darren Cross to this. He is a villain, and I'm highlighting him here because he adopted the moniker of 
Yellow Jacket. Darren Cross and Scott Lang uh, were both seeking out the same physician for heart conditions. Uh, some key issues you might want to look for are Hank's first appearance, if you can find it for a good price. Tales to Astonish 27. He became Ant-Man in Tales to Astonish 35. Janet Van Dyne first appeared in Tales to Astonish 44. The daughter, Hope Him, or Hope Van Dyne, a next number seven. Uh, Giant Man first appeared in Tales to Astonish 49. Became Goliath in Avengers 28. Yellow Jacket in Avengers 59. Scott Lang Lang's first appearance was in Avengers 181, and then you had uh, Scott Lang first appearing as Ant-Man in Marvel premiere number 47 as a cameo in, in 48. Cassie Lang first appeared in Marvel premiere 47 as well, but she became Stature in Young Avengers number 6, and Stinger in Astonishing Ant-Man number 6 from 2016. Eric O'Grady first appeared in Irredeemable Ant-Man number 1, and that really nasty domestic abuse case occurred in Avengers number 213. So there you have it folks, that's Ant-Man in a nutshell, both Hank Pym and the various folks who have come across him, whether it was family or other people who took up the mantle. But let me know down in the comments what you think of this video, as well as if you have any other facts to add or any other key issues to add. Ultimately, I want this to be helpful for other people. And if you have any other suggestions for history and origin videos, I'm always taking requests for that. Love to do these videos, they're a lot of fun. So that's it, this has been Ant-Man, History and Origin. I'll see you in the next video.